Hi everybody, welcome to your second and final workshop with me. Today's links directly to our first workshop a fortnight ago in its continuing focus on music education policy. This time though, we're coming at it from a more modern perspective in the 2010s. We'll be delving into the National Plan for Music Education, uh, which was England's first policy paper for music. The first iteration of it was released in 2011, uh, and there's a new one that's recently been produced in June of 2022, but we're going to be focusing on this first plan. And we're going to be thinking about how far its identification of policy problems linked with its proposed policy solutions. So the layout of the workshop is much the same as the first. We'll be having a lecture in the first half, then we're going to have a quick break, and then we're going to be discussing um, the spruce reading. In the first half then, uh, we'll be firstly talking about the proposed um, problems of music education around 2011, prior to the release of the National Plan. And these problems are told from the perspectives of teachers themselves, music educators. Secondly, we'll discuss how the National Plan responded to these problems, how they conceptualised the problems themselves, and how they formulated potential solutions. As I've said in that second bubble there, uh, the importance of the plan can't really be underestimated. It was the first time a policy had been put down on paper for music as a subject, and it was something that solidified the importance of music as the plan itself is actually entitled. Thirdly, we're going to discuss ways in which the plan in some ways misunderstood the originally identified areas of problem that were impacting music education at this time. These problems were uh, partnership work and its development across a mixed economy, the national curriculum in schools and continual worries over funding. So we can get a good grasp on what the issues were from music educators' perspectives at this time from a call for evidence document that was released for Darren Henley's review of music education. More on that later. The actual call for evidence document is brief. Uh, it's only three pages long and Henley accepts the methodology methodological uh, limitations of such a succinct document. Despite this, despite these limitations, the call for evidence provides an overview of music education's perceived successes and challenges prior to the plan's release. Three main themes arose, uh, these were funding concerns, partnership work with schools and the music education sector's breadth. So let's focus one by one on what these issues were then. One of them centred on the patchy nature of a nationally mixed economy in the music education sector. So we can define a mixed economy as the wide range of diverse options afforded to participants when there is strong partnership work across public and private providers. The scale of England's music education landscape um, which includes everything from one-to-one -one tuition, small group, classroom, extracurricular, informal settings, uh, the list goes on. This scale allowed young people to have a say and to include their own music making choices. Whilst these responses from the profession in the call for evidence document were positive, other educators questioned the potential for discordant provision in such a mixed economy. Various barriers limited full effectiveness of providing high quality coherent music education. These barriers included uh, one-off temporary projects where purposes and priorities weren't really that clear. Um, this then resulted in quantity over quality of provision and a lack of long-term impact. Largely unregulated one-to-one -one specialist provision also drew concern from some respondents. 
Many private instrumental teachers are obviously very highly skilled musicians, but research has shown that some teachers often enter the profession with low levels of preparation. The final sections of the Call for Evidence document asked the profession what they believed needed to change. In terms of the mixed economy, the profession wanted to see more strategic planning. They wanted a greater clarity on what provisions actually required. Um, they called for a need for better relationships between music services and schools and a network of local brokers to support these. The national curriculum was the second key issue the profession identified. Many highlighted children's core entitlement to curriculum music. Others, however, felt that this entitlement failed to translate into practice with curriculum music delivered either sporadically or not at all. Where the curriculum was delivered, respondents insisted that primary generalists uh, do not have appropriate knowledge, skills and understanding to deliver it well, citing a continuing insufficiency in initial teacher training and continuing professional development opportunities. So what did the profession think uh, needed to change? In terms of school curriculum obligations, uh, respondents propose that music provision must start young and include wider opportunities as a core entitlement. Wider opportunities acted as a precursor to the whole class ensemble teaching or WISIT that we see today. This wider opportunity should be delivered by visiting specialists. Uh, the profession also wanted clear, systematic progression routes that should arise after this point for those who show particular interest and or ability. Finally, uh, respondents inconsistently described funding for music education as both ring-fenced and unequal and insufficient, particularly for frontline delivery. Ring-fenced in this case means a grant or a fund with restrictions on it so that it can only be spent um, on one particular thing or for one particular purpose. Uh, figures quoted in the House of Commons in early 2009 cited the £82.5 million of Ring Fence grant that music services had, re had received across 2007-8 and 2008-9. But such a quotation uh, it doesn't really consider the complexities of how exactly this money was distributed across hundreds of music services that were in operation at the time. Ross Purves described the period from the Music Standards Fund's birth in 1998 to its forecasted demise in 2010 as a time of flexible accounting. Some local educational authorities um, acted upon loopholes um, in funding agreements and they actually withdrew their own funds in line with government grants. This in turn resulted in a real terms reduction in money for music services. By 2010, amounts available for music services across regional local authorities contrasted uh, hugely. Whilst the Music Standards Fund was ring-fenced, hence respondents' praises, its spurious applications at ground level equally supported respondents' concerns surrounding financial inequality and insufficiency. At the time of the plan's release as well, uh, Britain was also in the aftershock of a global financial crash and a period of austerity, um, austerity, austerity was ensuing. Uh, this meant generally an overall cut in arts funding. So what needed to change then for the profession in terms of funding? Uh, the profession wanted stable systems of funds which would help to facilitate equality across music services to bridge such historically enduring financial gaps. So now we've talked about the initial issues from the profession's perspective, we can move on to discuss Darren Henley who's up there in the right hand, top right hand corner, um, and his National Review of Music Education. In September 2010, Michael Gove, who was then Education Secretary, announced a review into English music education that would be led by Henley 
who was then managing director of the national radio station Classic FM. Henley's music education in England review was published on 7th of Feb 2011. It was pretty comprehensive. Uh, it contained 36 recommendations to tackle uh, what was deemed patchy music education provision. Henley spoke of nationally excellent music teaching from excellent teachers, but he also acknowledged music teachers' concerns over fragmented and uncoordinated national provision. He aimed for an impartial approach, stating that everybody involved in music education should share the responsibility for its difficulties. Uh, he went on to say that partnership is key to high quality and consistent music education for all pupils. To facilitate this, Recommendation 8 calls for collaboration between three key parties, that of classroom music, instrumental tuition and professional musicians. Spruce, uh, who we're going to discuss in more detail later, uh, talked of the enthusiastic support for Henley's review because it seriously considered the profession's grievances. A number of recommendations showed his commitment to a broad music education across the age range. Overall, uh, educators felt that Henley had shown a level of solidarity with them in hitting home the message that the national curriculum should be taught in schools. So Henley's review then held two central recommendations that would go on to influence the national plan greatly. These were recommendations three and recommendation 14. Number three, set out an entitlement to whole class ensemble teaching or WISIT for all key stage two pupils. This was particularly significant because it implemented WISIT nationally in every primary school for the first time. Whilst wider opportunities, which was a precursor to WISIT, had expanded since 2002, its reach only covered certain areas of the country. Under Henley's recommendations, no matter the region or the area that a child resided, they would have access to some form of practical, free, at point of access, music making in school time. Recommendation 14 called for a structural overhaul of a fragmented and uncoordinated music education landscape through newly devised music education hubs, or MEHs. Henley uh, envisaged hubs as more than simply a loose collective body of music making organisations. Uh, they would be led by local music services mostly, and they would exist as a community of schools, local authority music services, Arts Council England organisations, and other recognised delivery groups, coming together to deliver the very best rounded music education for all children. Prior to 2011, Music education providers often existed as separate organisations and they didn't really have a lot of um, impetus to unite. There were no formal strategies in place to encourage or to facilitate collaboration. Now, a network of local brokers would deliver WISIT as an established provision in all schools. Both recommendations here, 3 and 14, provided the greater clarity the profession desired. Henley's recommendations, if initiated, would allow all pupils an entitlement to learn the basics of a music, musical instrument. Through hubs, each provider would be aware of their individual responsibilities in delivering high quality music education provision. Henley's work was a review, however, with recommendations for government. The government guaranteed £82.5 million worth of ring fence funding for music provision in their response to Henley's review, but the profession would have to wait another nine months for a more definitive response on government's plans. So the National Plan for Music Education then. This was released uh, finally in November 2011 after a long nine month wait. It was a sizeable document of around 150 proposals. As I said earlier, its importance can't be uh, overstated. 
initiated significant infrastructural change that aimed to fundamentally alter the fragmented nature of English music education. Spruce initially described the plan, despite his eventual criticisms, as possibly the most significant statement of music education policy in England of the last decade. Despite its importance, however, a few academic sources have discussed the plan since its enactment and few still have provided a policy analysis. That is the research gap that I've been trying to fill for the last three and a half years with my thesis research. I went about analysing the national plan through Robinson's theories on the concept of quality policy design. Robinson makes clear the need for a match between the theory of policy problems held by the implementing agents, in this case the music educators, and the theory of the proposed policy, in this case the national plan. Robinson's use of the term theory describes the assumptions made by policymakers about the nature of the problem and what is required to address it. Basically, both uh, actors both the implementing agents and the proposed policy have to be on the same page about what's causing the problems and how to fix them. So using Robinson as a starting point, we can explore the theories, so to speak, that were set out in the plan and those from the sector and whether these actually match. So let's discuss the plan's first theory then, that of the music education sector's mixed economy and the processes of partnership work within this. The plan immediately adopted Henley's recommendations for structural change through hubs and they were set to begin work in September 2012. The plan clearly defines hubs' roles and responsibilities. They will take forward uh, and build upon provisions that were previously in place under local authority music services and they will help improve uh, the quality and consistency of music education across England both in and out of school. As part of this, hubs are tasked with delivering both core and extension roles which we're going to talk about in a bit more detail later. But who or what actually constitutes a hub. The plan uses the new term hub over 250 times but it's quite vague on what exactly they are. The plan acknowledges the improbability of a standard model for all hubs who will obviously be working in the context of their locality. It does give some clarification on typically expected actors in hub structures um, but again, it anticipates that many applicants will be local authority music services to lead hubs. Although the plan uses the term hub many times, its use is vague. This results in a lack of differentiation between the previous style of music service delivery and the new framework for delivery via hubs. This lack of definition causes various issues with the plan's own policy design. Firstly, uh, the plan places a breadth of roles and responsibilities upon music services regarding partnership work as expected hub leads. Some within the profession around this time viewed the plan's vision for partnership work as inspirational and a welcome shake-up but others questioned the level of consideration from policymakers towards the practicalities of developing these partnerships. Deborah Annette uh, described how hub operations will run in a much more complex way than music service deliverance of the past. It's going to be a patchwork of organisations coming together. While she acknowledged that many felt very fired up and inspired at the prospect of this, Others were really worried and concerned over the intricacies <clears throat> excuse me, of such work. Where out-of-school music provision had once been music ser services main remit, hubs would radically alter this dynamic. Music services would no longer work in a lone capacity. Their work now had to factor in collaborative uh, considerations of organisations at local, regional and national levels. Jonathan Savage raised his concerns over such high levels of responsibility 
uh, questioning where will coordination, leadership and direction come from. David Price, who was then Musical Futures project lead, highlighted Hub's vastly different designs nationwide and identified the plan's inability to acknowledge this as a major flaw. He ultimately foreshadowed that previous patchiness could continue. Secondly, the plan's language surrounding Hub's core and extension roles indicates a misreading of the breadth and reach of England's music education mixed economy. This confusion meant that the plan placed specialist instrumental learning at the forefront of provision. It's positioned here as the pinnacle of musical achievement at the expense of other forms of engagement, including generalist classroom provision. More on that later, but first let's go through these roles for new hubs. I've set out here the core and extension roles as they appear in the plan. The plan separates core and extension roles on priority and necessity of deliverance. Core roles are the expected fundamental provisions for all hubs. The plan stipulates that the Department for Education grant must be used to primarily fund core roles. The four core roles also exist as aspects by which future evaluative reports will primarily measure the success of hub work. So core role A states that pupils must provide, uh, sorry, states that hubs must provide pupils with a WISIT programme. B focuses on ensembles and performance opportunities. C ensures clear and affordable progression routes and D ensures a sing singing strategy in place for all pupils. Extension roles are expected of most hubs with additional funding left over from core roles to be spent here. Uh, extension role A states that hubs must offer CPD development for school staff to help them deliver the national curriculum. B encourages hubs to provide an instrumental loan service and C focuses on large scale and or high quality musical experiences for all pupils. Let's delve a bit deeper into these core roles then. Core role A stipulates WISIT as the central method through which all pupils will learn a musical instrument. But the plan is quite vague on WISIT's contextual placement. Where will it take place? Well, WISIT will take place in schools, with Ofsted undertaking primary level inspections of at least one whole class instrumental lesson where these are provided by the local authority music service slash hub. The responsibility for such provision, however, falls upon the local authority music service slash hub. Notice that the plan uses these two terms, music service and hub, interchangeably furthering a lack of differentiation between providers. The plan appears ambiguous regarding what the WISIT model will look like and how it will function effectively in all schools. The WISIT uh, method, by its nature, blurs the lines between statutory classroom provision and elective instrumental tuition. However, the plan hands responsibility uh, more so to the local authority music service slash hub for WISIT's inaction, despite its place as an in-school provision. Call roles B and D emphasise the need for both instrumental and vocal ensemble route opportunities. Most local authority music services across the country, particularly those with a long history in the orchestral tradition, would have been providing such performance opportunities up to this point anyway. The plan, however, aim to unite musical opportunities against the currently patchy music education landscape to increase access. Therefore, the plan emphasises opportunities for ensemble playing from an early stage in core role B and the inclusion of every pupil in singing opportunities in core role D. Core role C furthers this inclusive uh, vision. It requires clear and affordable routes for progression through such ensembles in efforts to avert financial barriers to music making. Despite this de uh, desire for cohesion, however, all these core roles, B, C and D, highlight the plan's uh, difficulties in providing clarity 
on hub definitions beyond the pre-existing work of uh, previously local authority music services. This is particularly the case in how the plan contextualises Core Role C's theme of musical progression. The plan dedicates a full section to such matters of progress, entitled Progression and Excellence. This immediately indicates some level of value judgment uh, from policymakers on long-term expectations for and purposes of musical learning. Whilst the plan initially identified that pupil circumstances would be many and varied, it goes on to present quite a narrow understanding of progression, as you can see here from the progression in music education model that appears in the plan. It essentially works on an all, most, some and few framework. All pupils get first access with it. Most will continue their interest beyond the classroom in and out of school in perhaps large or small groups, one-to-one -one tuition and ensembles. Some pupils show talent and receive specialist small group or one-to-one -one tuition and participate in ensembles. And a few, it states, are exceptionally talented and enter um, MDS or NYMO. MDS is the Music and Dance Scheme and NYMO is a uh, National Youth Music Organisation. So things like the National Youth Orchestra, for example. Can anyone uh, see anything that might be up with this model? Well, it's uh, based largely within specialist realms, incorporating one-to-one -one large group ensemble participation and for the exceptional um, elitist organisations such as the uh, national youth music organisations that are deemed within the plan the pinnacle of musical achievement. In this framework, musical excellence in this case, high levels of ability on an instrument, appear the sole indicator of achievement, which overlooks other forms of musical progression. The only difference existing between the forms of progression uh, through the specialist realm prior to the plan is the guarantee of first access WISIT uh, for all pupils, as opposed to provision just for a select few. Government has often um, failed to mark clear distinctions between facets of music education in the mixed economy that we talked about earlier. The main confusion occurs between classrooms, statutory music as part of the national curriculum and extracurricular elective instrumental provision, the latter of which is uh, historically bound up in local authority music service work. Focus on instrumental excellence is a sign of the plan's uh, failure to differentiate between such provisions at the expense of classroom work. It's also a sign of policymakers' perceptions that, as uh, Stunnell states, to be musical is to be able to play an instrument or sing well. The plan's conceptualizations of progression offer equality of musical opportunity up to a point the narrowed model of music uh, progression in largely specialist dimensions and the la lack of acknowledgement of other means of longitudinal musical engagement result in somewhat of a collapse of the plan's seemingly inclusive vision. So in conclusion to this section then, how did the national plan misunderstand the mixed economy of music education? Well, firstly, the plan emphasises progressive excellence in its progression model. This can be seen as a symptom of its key misunderstanding of the mixed economy. There appears to be confusion in the plan's language between classroom curriculum provision and extracurricular instrumental provision, the latter of which was the historical remit of music services. The plan's focus on musical excellence is a sign of its uh, difficulties in distinguishing between the two of these, at the expense of curriculum music. This can also be seen as a signal of policymakers' perceptions that to be musical is to be able to play an instrument or sing well. The only identifiable difference between the plan's progression model and that which was taking place in music services historically is the addition of first access provision as opposed to just one-to-one -one tuition. Most in the profession uh, praise the plan in that it acknowledged the importance of music. 
but it appears this acknowledgement of importance was only in a very limited form of music education. Finally, music services as hub leads bore the brunt of responsibility for partnership development, which furthered unequal relationship differentiation. The plan held two main consequences for schools in terms of the plan's second theory of schools place in a hub system. Firstly, the plan obliged schools to examine their own music curriculum offers and to ad adequately support those who were teaching music in their schools. Secondly, the plan promoted heightened collaboration between schools and newly implemented hubs. Schools within this framework must deliver the curriculum as their primary responsibility. In emboldened type, the plan clarifies that these statements impact all schools, including academies and free schools. This was an integral statement for music educators because it acknowledged the differences between maintained schools, those with central government funding, and academies and free schools as more independent uh, institutions. It understood academies' positions as schools with higher levels of curriculum freedom and the potential for them to overlook requirements of a broad and balanced curriculum. The plan appeared to view in-school curriculum music as the foundation for all other music making opportunities. It says, for example, most children will have their first experience of music in school. It sets out a linear pathway for musical continuation from primary schools, which foster pupils' interest, to secondary schools, which develop that interest further. And this growth um, is helped and supported by music education hubs. Hubs exist as cent centres of guidance for schools in delivering the curriculum across age ranges. And crucially, the plan also recognised generalist classroom teachers' lack of confidence in teaching curriculum music, thus requiring support in hubs extension role A. Despite the plan's emphasis on the importance of curriculum music, however, there are two linked statements in the plan that can appear to limit the integrity of the plan's seeming commitment to school music. These are, schools cannot do everything alone, they need the support of a wider local music structure, and schools cannot be expected to do all that is required of music education alone, a music infrastructure that transcends schools is necessary. The above quotes uh, can be seen as statements of recognition of the vastness of the mixed economy. The wider local music structure uh, is recognised as contributing to a collaborative effort. However, the statements can also be read as laying down unweighted expectation towards hubs um, and music services as their leads. The plan informs us that schools cannot be expected to provide sole music education opportunities. However, these statements don't consider the lack of school expectations surrounding music provision up to this point and the negative impacts of this for music's position in the curriculum. They speak to a broader theme in the plan of explicit expectation on hubs to provide core and extension roles compared to the lower responsibility for schools, particularly academies, in uh, exhibiting this towards curriculum music in the years prior. The plan's progression model and its emphasis on specialist forms further suggests an unequally balanced weight of responsibility for music provision on hubs. The plan assumes that most music education takes place outside of school, particularly in later stages. The term school only appears in the model in the context of first access provision. The plan doesn't explicitly recognise WISIT as part of the national curriculum, nor does it mention the national curriculum at all within the progression model. Whilst the plan does state that music education should be provided to all pupils through schools aged uh, 5 to 14, the term curriculum is actually absent. Despite the plan's insistence that successful provision encompasses a combination of generalist classroom teaching, specialist tuition and extracurricular ensemble opportunities, the progression model appears to weight expectation for provision upon the latter two elements. 
So in conclusion to this section then, how did the plan fail to understand school's place among hubs and the curriculum problem? The plan's vision for collaborative practices between hubs and schools was bold, but it was slightly misconstrued. I've included a quote here from Nick Howdell, who was Youth Music's Director of Programmes at the time. He stated in reaction to the plan that its success will depend on the spirit in which we all breathe life and meaning into it. In true partnership work, breathing life and meaning into provision should be the case for all parties. For the plan, schools could not do everything alone within partnerships, but schools appeared to provide far less than everything in the immediate years prior to the plan's release, as we talked about in our first workshop. This begs the question then, within an educational climate where curriculum music was sporadically delivered, how could hubs go about initiating the plan's expectations for partnership work in good faith? So onto our final plan uh, theory then, funding considerations. The plan proposed stable funds for hubs over the space of three years up to 2015 with scope for further financial assistance up to 2020. Across the three years, from April 2012, hubs would receive a total of £202 million. Year one, they'd receive £77 million. Year two, they'd receive £65 million. And year three, they would receive £60 million. In order to reform historically mismatched national funding streams, the plan proposed to distribute funds on a per pupil basis, weighted towards areas of higher economic disadvantage and for pupils eligible for free school meals. The plan claimed that after three years of such a funding arrangement, the historical imbalance of funding between areas will have been completely turned around. The profession generally applauded an immediate commitment to ring-fenced funding, but they equally criticised the 25% drop in funds over three years. If the central grant dropped over three years, where would hubs make up the extra cash? Well, in order to reframe this issue of real terms funding cuts over three years, the plan presented raising hub funds as a collaborative effort across providers, encouraging partnership work for hubs economic viability. Government expected hubs over three years to strive for a level of financial independence, gradually moving away from the reliance on the Department for Education grant towards other forms of proposed funding. These uh, could include, as the plan suggests, uh, sources from local authorities, cultural organisations, trusts, philanthropists, etc. The plan envisages the importance of partnership working, whereby hub success rests on their ability to evidence their improved value for money. So what were the problems with striving for this financial independence? It appeared that the plan hadn't taken into account the practical realities of attracting funding in a historically unbalanced landscape of provision. Research across the two decades prior to the plan's release attests to a financially fragmented landscape among local authority music services. Helen Rogers and Creech in 2005 found significant variation in funding sources across 149 music services. Financial sustenance from the Music Standards Fund, for example, ranged from 4% to 100%, while some services received as much as 59% of their income from parental charges. Hallam and others found two years later that there were vast differences in the provision of wider opportunities whole class ensemble's predecessor across the country. There were difficulties, for example, with serving smaller primary schools in widely dispersed areas as a result of funding issues. Adams in 2014 presented a historical analysis of three music services across 40 years of provision. Her thesis highlighted how historical, social, cultural, economic and geographical conditions of individual services all impacted the type and scope of provisions offered. These studies present vast differences across regions in music services individual funding structures. 
These historically embedded challenges contributed to the profession's fears over the plan's insistence on hubs' financial independence. Many felt that hubs based in more affluent areas might be better placed to attract funding from outside sources, particularly parental or philanthropic ones. Despite the plan's weighting of funds uh, towards disadvantaged pupils and thus areas, the geographical locations in which these hubs were based equally impacted abilities to attract funds. Moving to per pupil funding streams was a broadly sensical move because naturally those areas with larger proportions of pupils, particularly in disadvantaged areas, would benefit from increased funding. Yet hubs based in city or urban areas might benefit doubly from both per pupil funding and free school meals arrangements. Conversely, hubs based in smaller, more rural areas with potentially less children eligible for free school meals might suffer financially. In opening up accessibility to music education, the per pupil slash free school meals model held benefits. But the plan's strategies for tackling the entrenched and historically unbalanced landscape of funding across regions were simplified somewhat unable to fully consider the historically embedded and highly localised nature of music service provision. There were broader funding concerns from the profession too. The plan was vague regarding HUB's proposed uses of the Department for Education grant. While the government expected HUB's to spend at least 80% of DfE funds on frontline delivery, the plan provides no exact breakdown as to the weight of funding for specific roles. Interestingly, the plan states in a footnote that introductory whole class instrumental experiences will ideally be for a full year, but funding will provide for the minimum of one term. Ideally, WISIT would run as a year long entitlement in all schools. However, this is dependent on HUB's cap uh, capabilities to attract additional funding from schools to implement this length of provision. Also, the lack of uh, specificity on weighted funding towards core roles A to D means that hubs, dependent on the context of their working arrangements, could choose to invest more time and finance into one of the core roles over another. For those hubs led by a local authority music service with historical strengths in traditional orchestral provisions, WISIT could uh, potentially become an afterthought. Such potential variability means pupils' entitlement and access to broadly uniform provisions across regions remained fragmented. In this final third plan theory then, how far did it fail to consider HUB's financial matters? Well, the plan's funding models, although providing tens of millions of pounds for HUBs, came with a few covenants or compromises. The plan used its emphasis on partnership work to encourage HUB's economic efficiency by gradually reducing the Department for Education grant year on year. The proposed per pupil uh, free school meals weighted model had the potential to create an unequal terrain. Certain HUBs might receive top up funding due to their size and demographic whilst excluding those HUBs outside of this. The plan also misread the realities of attracting supplementary funding in a fragmented landscape where historically each local authority service experienced hugely varying levels of financial support. Let's conclude our workshop today then with a few final culminating thoughts on how far the plans and the profession's theories on music education's problems really matched as Robinson encouraged. In terms of the mixed economy and partnership work, the profession initially had called for strategic, clearer approaches to planning and requirements for provision. They'd wanted a network of local brokers to support this. They also wished specifically for greater relationship development between music services and schools. The plan, however, didn't provide such clarity on these issues. It fundamentally lacked a differentiation between new hubs and old music services. This resulted in a number of issues. Firstly, it meant that there was unrealistic expectation and responsibility placed upon music services as hub leads in a new complex system of working. 
Secondly, it suggested a misreading of the mixed economy. It placed specialist instrumental work at the forefront at the expense of other forms of musical engagement, most notably generalist classroom provision. And thirdly, it handed overall responsibility to local authority music services slash hubs, terms used interchangeably, for whole class provision, despite its place as an in-school activity. Also, the plan's conceptualisations of progress offer equality of musical opportunity up to a point, that point being first access or WISIT. The narrow model of expected progression in specialist dimensions means we can question the plan's overall inclusive vision. With regards to schools' relationships with hubs and their roles, the profession highlighted firstly how curriculum music must start young, how it must have a coherency across the age range and how it was ultimately schools' responsibilities to ensure this. Uh, secondly, they wish to see wider opportunities, the precursor programme to WISIP, as a core entitlement for pupils provided by specialists, much as it is now. Uh, thirdly, they wanted clear progression routes to be in place for all pupils. The plan initially seemed to understand the issues surrounding curriculum music. They made it clear that all schools, including academies, must deliver the curriculum. They saw hubs as a support for curriculum music within this. However, the plan tells us that schools cannot be expected to do it all alone. Schools up until this point had been doing very little than everything anyway, where nationally curriculum uh, music delivery had proven patchy. This, as a result, put pressure and unequal weighted responsibility upon hubs and music services as their leads. Within this, the plan's progression model seemed to suggest that most music provision took place outside of school and that policymakers failed to account for the broader educational climate that music educators were working in. Finally then, let's briefly turn to financial considerations. The profession naturally wanted a stable system of funding in place to ensure a level of equality across the country where historical uh, funding issues had meant that provision was unequal. The plan guaranteed over £200 million for hubs over three years, which sounds great. However, as we saw, this actually reduced over these three years. The plan encouraged hubs financial independence and presented raising funds as a collaborative effort across providers in order to make up this shortfall. The plan did not fully consider the practical uh, realities of attracting such funding in a historically unbalanced landscape of provision.